little to no consideration as to what caused the behaviour, like it has done today. Instead, these people will be put into social environments similar to how the Norwegian government have decided to orientate an angle of rehabilitation. If you want to know what I mean, Michael Moore actually visited such a prison uh, when he filmed his documentary Sicko. Even though he didn't include it in the in the final cut of the film, uh, it's in the extra features on the DVD um, called Is Norway a Utopia? Um, but if you don't have the DVD, uh, you can go on YouTube and find it. Uh, the video is called A Look at What an RBE Prison Would Look Like. It was uh, uploaded by, I think, uh, vradio.org. Um, but, yeah, it's, you know, it's truly inspiring stuff, what they've done in Norway. You know. Now, combine that with an orientation akin to a much more humane application of the rehabilitation principles of psychiatric care, and voila. Obviously, I can tell, even when saying this, that even the mention of psychiatric sounds like a fate worse than death. I mean, we have Hollywood to blame and thank for perpetrating the stagnant, ignorant, violent and flat out disgusting operant mentality that was employed in psychiatric hospitals in, I dare say, the late 1800s and early 1900s to mid-1900s. But when I say the principles of psychiatric care, I mean that the consideration is to get to the bottom of and understand what caused the aberrant behaviour in the first place and seek solutions through that root causality. And not even to seek pharmaceutical methods either. I mean, we recognise um, that the pharmaceutical solutions are just patchwork treatments that are made mostly to rake in huge profits for pharmaceutical companies and... You know, and, um, and create widespread dependence upon those drugs, which, by the way, invariably cause a hell of a lot of exacerbation in uh, patient psychology and physiology, if not causing a hell of a lot of secondary and or undesired side effects. Yeah. If, uh, if you look into the work of Dr. Gabor Mate, yeah, I seriously cannot recommend his work enough. He's a fantastic speaker and is incredibly knowledgeable about these things. I mean, you will notice that the key to rehabilitating so-called criminals is not to throw them in jail, punish them, or execute them, but actually the absolute opposite, to care for them, to look after them, to treat them like a human being. Because, as you will find out, it's mostly childhood abuse and childhood trauma that paves the way for behaviours such as addiction, addictions and violence. What the human mind and body needs to develop optimally is, as Dr. Marte puts it, a non-stressed, attuned, emotionally available, consistent, nurturing, parenting caregiver. And that is the point here. At some point along the line, for the vast majority of criminals, they've never had that. They've never felt loved and received for who they are never been respected and accepted and the approach in an RBE is to assess exactly what, where, when, why and how it went wrong and actually provide that compassion and help that they had never ever received. And you know, for those of you listening to this who are thinking, oh no, they're monsters, yeah, you just lock them up, yeah. seriously. We as a species really need to get over ourselves in respect of how we react, behave and treat criminals. And in particular when it comes to individuals who committed acts such as rape, murder and child molestation. Okay, listen carefully. Currently, the common and even accepted methodology, first off, is to label them as sick or perverts or monsters and many, many other names which are, <laughs> let's face it, just as vicious as the crimes themselves. You know, we're so deeply and hopelessly entrenched in this revenge mentality that it's beginning to look quite frightening even, even to the extent that in, even in conversations with people on the subject, if I even try to say anything that is not akin to expressing grotesque fantasies of torture, humiliation, mutilation and death 
towards such criminals, then I have found myself somehow deserving of being at the receiving end of such acute and disturbing animosity and hatred that I have felt as though I must also somehow be guilt be also guilty of such an act and and as such I'm being treated that way you know while this is completely counterproductive and surprisingly divisive do you know what I can understand the reaction and behavior of such people in these circumstances they feel so personally affronted and disgusted and emotionally injured by the very hearing or reading of such an act that they will project the intended hatred will for vengeance and hostility at anyone who doesn't feel exactly the same way they do you know if they do it to, to norm, normal people that aren't towing the line imagine what they would do to the actual perpetrators seriously we are you know that mentality is just as bad I'm sorry to say it I mean the point is that when we label these individuals with the hateful words that we do we are conveniently overlooking what has actually caused this behavior to manifest in them was Albert Fish born a cannibalistic serial killer no he was made into one by years and years of systematic abuse trauma and stress was Ed Gein born a serial killer no he was made into one by years of physical verbal and emotional abuse not to mention the firebrand religious indoctrination at the hands of his mother so you see with with that said the act of labeling someone who is killed as a monster is not addressing what the root cause of their behavior might be and conveniently sweeping that con consideration under the rug because of course it's far easier to punish exert revenge and extract our pound of flesh out of those who are conditioned into such behavior than to ever look deeper and consider that there is something below the surface and clearly below the established mindset that is actually causing this kind of behavior to manifest how much longer are we going to take the easy way out here I mean if you want to get a full scope on um, on this uh, the psychology that uh, that brings this sort of thing about um, Dr. Ma Marte did a talk called Addictions and Corrections. Um, you can find it, uh, on, find it on YouTube. Um, it's about an hour long. However, if you wish to have a shorter, more abridged version, and also don't mind listening to some gentle dubstep music in the background, um, the YouTuber Say Days Ago 2008, who is also a member of our movement, uploaded the, uh, the Redux Dubstep Mix. Of um, of addictions and corrections, uh, and it cu it cuts the whole talk down to just over ten minutes. So, you know, if you want to have it a ten minute version and don't like and don't mind dubstep, that's for you. But when it comes to the prevention of cr of harm to others, then this is a case of only partial segregation from society as a whole, because of course we still need to treat them like human beings and not slaves. You know. I mean, Norway really has got the right idea when it comes to these things, and it works. You know, they've they've got one of the Norway has got one of the lowest murder rates in the world, and I think the uh, the longest uh, life sentence is something like uh, fifteen years, and it's only been served like a couple of times ever. You know, we should be learning from them. <laughs> Anyway, moving on. Question three. Uh, I personally think the RBE is a good concept, but I don't think one man is capable of laying out an entire plan for society without having some edges to rough out. What's wrong with hearing a few differing opinions? Okay, well, I think I got this question before um, TZM and TVP split, but... Um, you know, Jacques Fresco has spent his entire life almost on the development of these proposals, but as as um, as you will see, he's definitely not the only one. I mean, one of the things that I feel especially excited about in regards to TVP's separation from TZM 
is that we are so much more free to collaborate and exchange ideas with as many organizations and movements as we can manage to make this change happen as soon as humanly possible. You know, the, p the possibilities are now so endless, it's unbelievable. That, you, know, you are absolutely right here, though. There is nothing wrong with hearing other people out. And that that is what we're doing, you know. I mean, um, you know, um, as you know, as the movement, we have every intention of doing just that. You know, the more people we can converse with and progressively exchange ideas with, the better. As far as I'm concerned, now the separation was a wonderful thing to happen to TZM because it has given us a reminder of our responsibilities, our goals and also our vulnerabilities, uh, but also fi it finally granted our freedom to speak with who we want to speak with and collaborate with who we want to collaborate with. I mean, I look into the future with a great sense of hope and openness and optimism now. Anyway, question four. Uh, in a transition phase, until the time when all required tedious jobs can be automated for real, what alternative to money could be used to coordinate participation when certain jobs get recurrent recurrent, sorry, um, or occasional insufficient numbers of volunteers? Mandatory part time work, example Parason job complex, or a system of incentives, if so what type uh, what type what system or and other solution? Transition. Well, it's a transition question. Um, well, this is simply a case of implementing different methods of skill set trading and time banks. I mean, these kinds of ideas aren't really new. I mean, when it comes to skill trading, there's ideas such as the free economy idea, which is essentially operates like uh, you know, I fix your bike for you because I'm a mechanic and in return you give me a piano lesson because you're a piano teacher. You know, I, ideas like this have been seen floating around for quite some time, you know, but um, time banks will also become very integral. I mean, we in the movement have been talking about this sort of thing for, for, a, for a while. I mean, we had this idea, um, we already have this idea that we call the Z bank. Um, Essentially, a time bank is a system where a certain amount of currency is placed upon an hour of labor done. So it doesn't matter what labor you're performing, you get a set amount for each hour that you're doing it. Say, for example, that an, an entire town decided to implement a time bank. You know, just picture how wonderfully efficient and collaborative that would be. Imagine... Um, you know, a, a certain town, if you know, implementing a time bank and a skill trading system. That you know, but I mean, besides those, I dare say certain methods of barter will jostle places here and there. But but it's our hope to get things going as soon as possible. I mean, um, you know, the collapse is going to be very nasty, and we need to pick up the pieces as quickly as possible so the least amount of people die. Now, it might be the case that after the collapse, um, several decades might pass between the collapse and the Im implementation of an RBE. Well, as long as we have our time bank systems in place and people are getting used to those, then it's a very good incentive shift and a very good value system shift as well. People will be orienting themselves towards social interest instead of self-interest. And that's wonderful because that is the direction we need to be heading towards. Yeah? But anyway, question five. Uh, you say that people will grow and learn and educate themselves, but what about those who truly have no mental capacity to understand this direction? A lot of people can be intelligent and considerate, but some people are just point-blank dumb. How can people like that be taught the principles of an RBE, let alone be expected to orient themselves uh, well in such a system? Would such people be in danger of becoming violent or destructive? How would they be dealt with? Okay, that's actually uh, uh, that's actually a really interesting question. I mean, obviously, 
there is a great di- even now there is a great diversity of 